Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real joy to be here this afternoon. Although I have to say, um, it's never easy for a World Bank official to give a speech on agriculture on a Sunday afternoon, but when one has to follow brilliant performances and brilliant speeches from not one but two princes, this is surely an unfair cross uh, to bear. But it really is a pleasure to be here. Let me express the gratitude of all of us here to the Netherlands for convening this very important event. It is highly appropriate that the Netherlands should convene this event because their leadership on agricultural research, on water resource management, and indeed on the topics that we're discussing this week are well known throughout the world. Let me say what a pleasure it's been for the World Bank to work with the Ministry of Agriculture here in the Netherlands. I'd like to pay tribute uh, to Hans Hugeveen and Jürgen Vogeli in particular for real leadership in putting this important conference together. Let me also say that the uh, beautiful dance and song we've heard this afternoon is not just for entertainment. It is because to solve the problems we're talking about, it requires a change of heart as well as a change of mind. Now imagine for a moment, if you can, and it's not easy, that you live in a small African village. Let's say in Niger. You've been farming for many, many generations. It's never been easy, but recently it's become more difficult. Weather seems to be less reliable. Water seems to be scarcer. Agricultural yields seem to be more variable and the prices you get for your crops seem to be more volatile. Fast forward one, two, three or four decades, we have a choice. Things could be worse and under present trends they probably will be. Yields will be lower, water will be more scarce, not only for your crops but it'll take longer to get water for your use. Incomes will be lower, poverty will be greater, and it is possible that that village will not be able to survive as a village. Or, yields could be higher, prices could be stable, water could be reliable, and that farmer could be receiving payments from global carbon markets for sequestering carbon in the soil. The choice is ours. The first outcome is more likely than the second one. The second one will happen, but only with serious leadership. And we believe that this conference this week can be a very, very important start to get there. It's hard to imagine a more important conference on a more vital topic at a more crucial time. If we use the next five days wisely and well, we can significantly move forward an agenda that will improve food security, help address climate change, and improve the lives of, and livelihoods of tens, maybe hundreds of millions of rural dwellers who today live in poverty. Not a bad week's work. For too long, we have tended to look at climate change, food security, and poverty separately. In today's world, we can no longer afford to do so. We've already been reminded this afternoon that 75% of the world's poor live in rural areas. We know that agricultural production will need to increase by 70% by 2050 in order to feed 9 billion people. We know that climate models predict a much more uncertain climate for world agriculture with potentially devastating downside possibilities. And we know that agriculture, forestry, and land use change account for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, with agricultural land accounting for about half of this. So at this conference, we'll be searching for the elusive triple win. Policies and programs that will first increase farm productivity and incomes, second, make agriculture more resilient to variations in climate, and thus promote stability and security, and third, help make the agriculture sector part of the solution to the climate change problem rather than part of the problem itself. There's good news 
there's growing evidence that the scope for such triple win strategies is greater than many had thought. A number of countries are already making real progress in addressing the three challenges we're discussing. Consider China. It has 250 million farm families, many of whom have one hectare or less. China has limited land and water resources and likely to face increasing water stress and rising temperatures over the coming decades. Yet China manages to feed its people and has a strategy for climate resilient, low carbon emitting agricultural growth. For two decades, China has supported comprehensive programs of landscape restoration, focusing on its hilly areas. As Prince Charles mentioned, the Los Plateau program is about the most famous. These include large-scale erosion control and restoration of stream beds, together with grazing control, agroforestry, and agricultural innovation. As a result, productivity has grown, ecosystems have been restored, the landscape is more resilient to floods and drought, and has become a net sequesterer of carbon in the soils and plants, rather than an emitter. Half a world away in Brazil, there are also emerging successes. Unlike China, Brazil has abundant land and water resources, and these days, of course, is an agricultural exporting superpower. But while its overall carbon emissions are low for a country of its income, nearly three quarters of those emissions come from agriculture, land use change, and forestry. In addition, its water resources are unevenly distributed, much of its soil is poor, and climate change is likely to increase water stress in key parts of the country. For nearly 40 years now, Brazil has invested in research and technological innovation to increase the fertility of its soils with great success. And now it's supporting land management techniques which protect stream beds, conserve vegetation, and carbon in the soil. We'll be looking at these impressive results in the program this week. But it's not just middle-income countries that are showing success. A number of African countries are also taking action. In Kenya, for example, 40% of the population earn less than $2 per day. And issues of food security, better yields, and greater resilience to floods and droughts are very urgent priorities. So Kenya is piloting these triple-win investments. Its famous Greenbelt movement is benefiting from carbon finance for reforestation and soil management. And community-led programs in the west of the country are investing in sustainable land management in coffee and maize farming systems with the objective of increasing carbon sequestration in the soil while increasing productivity and resilience. A robust accounting methodology has been developed allowing emissions reductions to be documented thus potentially drawing in carbon finance. So we'll be looking at these and many other examples during the week. Such initiatives require leadership, learning by doing, and the ability to think and plan in an integrative manner. There are no blueprints, and the best successes are tailored to the countries, and they are homegrown. But there are common lessons, and we'll be trying to learn them this week. Scaling up such programs will require more funding, and we'll be discussing this issue on Wednesday. There's been a sad history of underinvestment in agriculture over past decades, and this must be reversed. Countries themselves and the development community must share the blame. From 1990 to 2002, official development assistance in agriculture declined from 10% to 4% of total development assistance. Things have changed for the better recently, but still not enough. African countries have committed to increasing spending on agriculture to 10% of their national budgets, and progress towards that goal has begun. And international supporters are doing more. World Bank Group financing for agriculture, for example, has increased by 60% over the past six years and doubled in Africa. A strong IDA 16 replenishment will be essential to help maintain the momentum of the renewed focus on agriculture. Agriculture also needs to tap into funds available for climate change. At last year's Copenhagen meeting, 30 billion was promised for the three-year period 2010 to 2012, together with a longer-term commitment of 100 billion per year by 2020. And the high-level advisory group on how to raise that 100 billion will be issuing its report this coming 
Thursday in New York. It is vital that the voice of agriculture be heard in Cancun and subsequent meetings of negotiators so that it gets its fair share. In the meantime, it's important that agriculture receives an appropriate share of the various funds that are already available. Notable here is the 6.3 billion climate investment funds managed by the World Bank and the regional development banks. Its adaptation window, the pilot program for climate resilience, is likely to allocate almost half of its resources to agriculture and watershed management, given the vital role these sectors play in overall national resilience. Financial flows to developing countries from carbon market finance may well rise to over $50 billion a year by 2030. So far, the overwhelming bulk of such flows has been to middle income and to power and industrial related investments. As a result, only 2% of these flows go to Africa. Now, thanks to extraordinary work over the past three years, forest investments are now almost ready to be included in such carbon markets under the Red Plus program. The livestock program, the livestock sector is already eligible for carbon finance, but we've made no such progress for arable agriculture and soils. We thus need to see an equivalent effort to ensure that two to three years from now, the agricultural sector is ready for funding from this source. This requires difficult issues relating to monitoring, reporting, and verification, the so-called MRV agenda, and we'll be discussing these questions this week. In closing, what are we really trying to accomplish by this remarkable conference? First, uh, we will seek to understand. These are difficult issues, technically and politically, and lessons are emerging rapidly from the front line. Decision makers and technical specialists need to share perspectives with the goal of learning from each other. Second, we will strategize on how to apply the emerging understanding so that a rapid scaling up may be possible. The presence of ministers from 60 countries later in this week will make this possible. Third, we will seek to get ready for the opportunities that a global deal on climate could provide. Nobody expects a global deal at Cancun, but there will surely be one before too long. Associated with this will be financing for both adaptation and mitigation. It is vital that agriculture is understood to have a clear, clear role to play and that the needs and interests of the farming and food commu communities, especially in poor countries, are adequately reflected. Finally, we will discuss how to engage. Ministries of Agriculture have not generally participated in formal climate change discussions. Climate change negotiators, for their part, are frequently not familiar with agriculture. There is an opportunity now to change this, and this conference can play an important role. At Cancun, parties need to agree to a major new thrust of work on agriculture, food security and climate change, as was recommended in the preparatory meeting for this conference in Addis Ababa last month. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to work to show how agricultural systems can be at the same time more productive, more resilient, and with a low, lower carbon footprint. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is an unprecedented gathering. Let's build on what our African partners started in Addis. Let's grasp the opportunities to link agriculture with the transition to lower carbon emitting climate resilient growth. Let's this week prepare a roadmap for action that we then hold each other accountable for. Let's turn the promise of the triple win into reality. Thank you very much.